Hey guys, it's Ryan Bridge, the Bugman, and I'm coming to you from Bugman headquarters in the Bugman studio. Hey man, today, great day. Today, we're going to be talking about the Cecropia moth. This is my favorite moth all time, man. And I have right here in the studio, and we're going to look at him today. Hey man, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ryan Bridge. People call me the Bugman. The reason they call me the bug man, I go to schools and churches, libraries, all kinds of cool places. And what I do, I bring a ton of cool bug fun to you every day. Today, we are going to be focusing on this moth. This is called the Cecropia moth. And again, they are my favorite moths of all time. And the best part is, man, they live right here in North America. This is the largest moth in North America, the Cecropia moth. Now, the Cecropia moth is a member of the giant silk moths. And I did a program some time ago about giant silk moths, and we talked a little bit about these. But you know what? Right now, Cecropia moth cocoons are hatching. I live in Pennsylvania. My cocoons are hatching. I'm hearing other people's, their cocoons are hatching too. So this is a good time of year. I want to take advantage of the fact that I have these moths alive right here in the studio that we can take a good look at a live Cecropia moth. And unfortunately, that means I don't have the caterpillars and I don't have some of the other stuff yet, but I do have some good images that I'm going to throw at you here in a little bit. But we'll get to all that cool stuff. Let's talk a little more about the Cecropia moth. Yes, it's a giant silk moth. Moths are in the family Lepidoptera, right along with butterflies and skippers. They're all in that same order, Lepidoptera. These are also Saturnid moths. They're in a family Saturnid, Saturnidae. Therefore, they're a Saturnid moth, a.k.a. giant silk moth, a.k.a. Cecropia. That's what this is. Largest moth in North America, and they live right in your backyards, fly your neighborhoods all summer long. And I'm going to tell you enough information, hopefully, that you are at least able to maybe see one of these for yourselves. And if all goes well, you're going to be able to maybe even rear these beautiful moths. Let me put her off to the side here before she starts flying away from me. Awesome, awesome moths. I love these moths. Okay, let's get started because I'm going to just keep getting excited over this. Look, the Cecropia moth is not the only moth that's going to be flying your neighborhoods and flying around your backyards this summer. There's a whole bunch of them. But I want to throw the, the, the most common ones, the biggest ones that you're probably going to be able to see, I'm going to throw at you right now. So there is the Cecropia moth that we're talking about today. There are also going to be some Polyphemus. That's a cool looking moth with those big fake eye spots. Expect to see some Luna moths, and these are one of a kind. Green moths with the big long tails on them. Everybody likes Luna Maws. I've got a bunch of those cocoons hatching out as well right now. You're also probably going to be looking at some tulip tree silk moths that are going to be flying. If they're not already flying, they're going to be flying very soon because these also start coming out kind of early. And then we can go to the next bigger ones yet are going to be the Regal Moth. And look at that. And, I have you. and the Imperial Moth out standing moths. Okay, so you get it. We're all back to giant silk moths, Saturnid moths, Cecropia moths. She's beautiful. All right, I'm going to let her chill for a little bit. We'll bring her back in a minute. But I want to I want to make sure we get everybody a good idea of what we're talking about cuz these moths are not uncommon. They're not rare. The problem is they fly at night. And not all moths do that, but the giant silk moths, they definitely do. They fly late at night, and especially with the Cecropia, man, you're talking a moth that's going to fly somewhere between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, they're usually the last big moths to drop down onto lights when I'm when I'm running lights, um, and I tend to run all night. I run right up to daybreak, and then that's usually when I pack it up because I try to I try to give these moths every minute of the night that I can to get them in. So running lights is a good idea. That's a great way to find these moths. If you live in a place where you can get away with it, that's good. I do it in my backyard, but I gotta keep things toned down a little bit because I have neighbors. They may not appreciate that moth the same way I do. All right, so giant silk moths are there. Let's get into the life history of this moth because uh, I get a lot of questions. People, there, there's people out there that have never 
had the opportunity to see one of these moths ever before in the wild. Um, and yet the moths are there. They live in an area where the moths are. So, so they're either not looking at the right time of the year or they're not looking at the right time of the night or morning. Um, or maybe they're just in an area that just doesn't support the food plants. But the weird thing about these moths, the food plants are, there's a huge variety of food plants. So I find it hard to believe that the moths aren't there. They just may not be as as common as they are other places. These things are probably regionally common. I can definitely believe that. All right, I can easily see that happening. So let's look at the life history because a female Cecropia moth, isn't she beautiful? A female Cecropia moth, an average egg load of a female Cecropia moth is gonna be anywhere from about probably 350 eggs all the way up to 600, and that's a big wide average, but that's because moths, larger moths, can sometimes uh, load out a, a larger egg mass, and, and therefore these things can sometimes pack, you know, up to 600 plus eggs. Um, I've heard from other people who have had the big seven and a half and eight inch females that they have gotten in excess of 700 eggs out of these moths. So I, I, I think, and that's, that's believable. These are believable people. So I, I honestly feel it's possible because I know for a fact that there's other larger species of silk moths out there in the world that can push out in excess of 800 uh, eggs. So, so these things, the females are nothing but a huge egg production factory is really what they are. And in the process, let's talk about those eggs because the eggs are going to be like a pinhead. And I, and I had pictures of the eggs, but they just, it just doesn't work because I can either make them look like a, I can either make them look like a grapefruit or I can just, you know, tell you about them. Um, I'm just going to tell you, they're about the size of a pinhead. That's, that's easiest. You can visualize it in your head better than you would in a picture. They're the size of a pinhead. And, and the caterpillars that are going to come out of those eggs are going to be very, very tiny. So much so that my pictures of the, the newly hatched ones didn't do me any justice either. But I can tell you they're very tiny. And what happens is these caterpillars hatch out of the eggs and one of their very first meals is gonna be that hatched eggshell that they actually came out of. And that will usually tide them over for a day or two while they'll relax and they don't do much. They just kind of rest and then they'll begin to feed. Now, when we talk about food plant, and this gets real because this is this is why they're so common in your neighborhoods. We're talking, we're talking cherry is the number one food plant that I find Cecropia is using. And I, I've got little wild cherry trees planted and transplanted all over my yard because I raise so many of these things every year. And and I gotta keep the food plant available. But they'll feed, they'll use cherry, they'll use maple, they'll feed on willow, they'll feed on uh, elderberry and and plum, and I know people who have fed them lilac. Um, geez, there, there's just, a, uh, they'll feed on a, a ton, birch, man. I, I had them on birch last year. So there's, there's not too many things that, tomato, I know people that found one in their tomato garden. They thought it was a big tomato hornworm. It turns out it was a cecropia larva. So there's not too many things I think these caterpillars won't eat even if it's in a pinch, I think they'll still eat it. Uh, even oak surprised me last year because I never reared mine on oak before. Uh, and I ended up raising, you know, rearing a bunch on oak when I ran out of most of my cherry because too many caterpillars means not enough food plant. So lots and lots of food plant. And those trees and those bushes and shrubs, those are all things that, that are in your neighborhoods. So that's why the moth is so common throughout this range. East of the Mississippi, you can expect to have a pretty good population of Cecropia moths somewhere near you. Again, they're flying so late at night and so early into the morning that most people never see them. We just don't invest that time. And I'll show you, I'm gonna tell you some other ways that you can go maybe find Cecropia moths on your own as well, because I want you to have this type of experience. These things are so cool. Everybody should do this, especially if you have kids. Kids really love these things, all right? so. They, they lay a bunch of eggs. The eggs are going to hatch little tiny caterpillars that are going to feed on a bunch of different food plant right in your yards, right in your neighborhoods. They're there. Trust me on that. All right. Now, whew, getting excited because I love these moths. So those eggs are going to hatch into tiny caterpillars. Those caterpillars are going to grow. Now, the only way to grow is to molt. However, however, before we before we get into that, I want to I want to talk about the fact that, that they're going to have to go through what are called instars. So if you ever see a thread where people are talking about caterpillars and they're talking about first instar, fifth instar, whatever, those are growth ranges. Um, and and most caterpillars have what is referred to as five 
instars. Each molt for a caterpillar is a growth stage. That growth stage also means that caterpillar is likely going to double in size. So to give you an idea, here's, here's, a, here's an image of what a caterpillar, a cecropia caterpillar, looks like when it's going to be molting. And I want you to take a good look at that because they literally, they grab the branch with their back feet, those back feet then hang on and, and then they will literally crawl right out of their own skin. And then they'll turn around and sometimes they'll eat that skin and then they'll hang out, wait for a day or so, and then they'll begin feeding again. And that's just what they do. Pretty cool stuff. So you've got these caterpillars that are growing and they're, and they're maturing and they're getting big through instars. Now, a fifth instar cecropia moth caterpillar looks like that. That is a full-size caterpillar, big, fat, and heavy. That is a prime caterpillar. It's a beautiful caterpillar. That's why I took a picture of that one. That was that was almost a five-inch caterpillar. Um, and in all honesty, in, in the wild, you're probably going to get a lot of five-inch caterpillars. In captivity, most of my caterpillars are about four inches, four and a half tops before they go into cocoon. A five-inch caterpillar, especially a cecropia caterpillar, is going to make a giant moth. And I'm still waiting on that cocoon to hatch because that's going to be a nice one. So you get it. Walking out of their skin, five instars later, now they're a big, fat, beautiful caterpillar. Take a look at the, the uh, tubercles on the cecropia moth caterpillars. Right there's an image. So take a look. Now those are, they're sharp and spiky, but they're not poisonous or not venomous. There, you know, there, there could be people out there, I guess, might be allergic to those things, but odds are nobody's going to get hurt by these things. You're talking a harmless caterpillar. Doesn't bite, doesn't sting, doesn't hurt anybody. The moths, just like butterflies and moths, aren't going to bite you, sting you. There's nothing harmful about these moths. They're just beautiful moths. We'll put her over here where she can relax. So I'm not wiggling around so much. And, you know, People find these caterpillars all the time, and people find big caterpillars a lot. And here's why. When a caterpillar reaches fifth instar, its biggest, most mature stage, they go into this weird period where they don't want to make a cocoon yet, but they're also not really done, you know, being a caterpillar yet. So they wander. And sometimes these caterpillars will wander long distances. Uh, sometimes looking for a place to build a cocoon or dig into the ground and, and pupate underneath the ground. Other times they're wandering just because they're in that weird phase. And people find these big caterpillars all fall, you know, late summer and fall um, because that's what they're doing. They're in a wandering phase. And, and they may find them on trails or roads or driveways or just weird places because the caterpillars are just aimlessly meandering around waiting for a, you know, a suitable place to build a cocoon. Um, when the giant silk moths, when the cecropia moth particularly, when it gets to the point it's ready to make a cocoon, it's going to start using silk, but it's going to mold itself with leaves. And sometimes cecropia, cecropia larvae are weird, where they will sometimes wander up onto somebody's front porch and they'll build a cocoon next to the shutter, or they'll build a cocoon hanging on a on a you know on a basket or something that's there for decoration on the front porch. I've seen cecropia cocoons in weird weird places over the years. So they're not always on the food plant where we would think they would be or at least where we think they should be. The caterpillars will wander, build a cocoon. When they build the cocoons, the cocoons are going to look like this. And this is about a classic cecropia cocoon. And I want you to take notice cuz this is how it would be on the on the tree as well on a branch. Even if the branch is hanging downwards, if, if the branch spirals out and hangs down, the cocoon is going to hang sort of like this. And the, the exit, this long drawn out part of the cocoon, that's where the moth is going to crawl out of when it's time to emerge. And they usually hang that on the downside of the branch. And that's, that's worth remembering because if you find these cocoons, it's important to realize that when you put them into your cages or when you're going to store them, it's, it's best to store them the way they're supposed to hang. And cecropias have this neat habit of, of using this exit at the, down, at the down end of the cocoon. That is because the moth, female, male, doesn't matter, is going to crawl out of the cocoon and wrap itself and hang on to the cocoon. And I'll show you how that looks. They're going to hang on to the cocoon just like that. And they'll sit there and they'll push out 
their wings. Now, let me get into the cocoon one more time real quick because this is important. I keep messing this up, but I'm going to keep going here anyway. Um, the cocoons are going to be built probably in like mid-June. They're going to then stay in that cocoon all winter long. That's the whole point of cocoons when it comes to giant silk moths. Usually they, usually, because there's times they don't, but usually they stay in that cocoon all winter long. Cecropia moths are one brood. When they make that cocoon, they're in that cocoon all winter long. Now, here's what it looks like inside the cocoon. Here's a cool picture. All right, a couple things I want to point out. Inside the cocoon, the first thing we're going to do, I want you to notice that outside layer, that's the visible layer. There's not going to be leaves and things on that by the time most of us find these cocoons because the leaves weather off, just like the leaves fall out of the trees in the, in the fall. They also get weathered off by rain and, and different things. They dry out and, and, you know, and just kind of fall away, exposing that silken cocoon. But that outside layer is what we're going to see. That then, If you look inside, though, there's a secondary chamber. That secondary chamber is a very hard, you know, thick layer of silk. And the inside that is where the chrysalis for the moth is going to be. Now, let's look at the area between that second, that inner chamber and that outside layer. That is an air pocket. And that is really important because that is going to insulate not only that second chamber, but it's going to insulate the chrysalis and hole. So these, these cocoons are built in a way that the frost, the snow, the rain, even, even a lot of the predators aren't going to be able to gain access to the cocoons and easily kill this, this chrysalis or kill the moth, if you will. So the, the inside of the cocoons are amazing. Now take a, nice, a, a close look at the chrysalis inside the cocoon as well, and you're going to notice the antenna, the wings, everything is there ready to go. And what that is at the very bottom end of that chrysalis is that's the shed skin from the caterpillar. That was the last thing the caterpillar did before it, it shed the skin and made one last molt and exposed that chrysalis. And that's how it works. They're, they, they grow, they make the cocoon, now they're in the cocoon, and they're in that cocoon all winter long. So from maybe mid-June all the way till the following mid-May, you can expect that they're going to be in there. Now, quick tip, if you go out in the winter time, you can go look for Cecropia cocoons. You can look for moth cocoons in general, but Cecropia cocoons, these are awesome to find, man. And look, they come in all shapes, all sizes, all colors, sizes. There's very big Cecropia cocoons out there, man. That, that's a giant moth. That was a really big seven and a half inch moth. But they're going to come in all shapes. I've noticed over the years that when I've been rearing, when I raise Cecropias, different food plants will very often create different colors of cocoons, which is kind of cool. That's kind of neat. So you may find it in different colors. Don't look for just a straight brown Cecropia moth cocoon. Think in terms of the shape, think in terms of the food plant, think in terms of where they like to go. They're usually not high up on the trees. They're almost always at waist Waist, maybe eye, and we'll call it eye, eye height or, or lower. They're normally not higher than your eyeballs. So, so look there, but you don't have to focus too much effort on that. Watch down low because the lower they are and the deeper they are into the, into the green briar and into the mix of stuff that's down there, they're going to be hidden by the, you know, by the birds and, and that way they, they survive better. So most of the ones that are way up in there, you know, and exposed real big, they're the ones that are going to get targeted first and the birds are going to get those. So just a couple tips. But in the winter time, great time. You know, pick nice warm clothes, snow, no snow, doesn't matter. Find yourself a suitable day that you can go hike around in the woods, walk the trails, walk those places where food plant is there because now you know what the food plant is. Go find these cocoons. They're out there. You just got to go look. All right. I will do a program on cocoon hunts, but not now. Obviously, we're a little late in here for that. So, because now we're springtime. No cocoon hunting in springtime. Okay, so all these cool cocoons are eventually going to hatch. When they hatch, this is what a newly hatched, or a, we'll call this freshly hatched Cecropia moth looks like. Freshly hatched. Now, that's not within, you know, a minute or two. That's probably within five minutes of coming out of the cocoon. But you notice the wings are pushed up a little bit better. They're not quite as small and, and, and you know, shriveled up as they would be. 
They're, the moths are going to come out of the cocoon, they're going to hang off the cocoon, and then they're going to push blood into the wings. That blood is called hemolymph. That's what insect blood is called. They're going to push blood into those wings. That's going to unfold and unfurl. Butterflies and moths don't grow wings. They have to push blood in and literally unfold the wings out. And that's how that works. It takes about an hour for the moth to get the wings fully you know, pushed out to where they look like they're ready to go, but they're going to be real flimsy, almost like tissue paper. So they're not going to be able to do anything for a couple hours. It takes a few more hours for them to fully dry out before they're truly ready to take flight. And that works good because a lot of these moths are going to come out during the, the early morning hours and it gives them all day to relax and chill and sleep and rest up before they're flying that night. Kind of cool stuff. Cool? All right. I love this. I love these moths, man. And finding these cocoons is outstanding. So, you know, if you haven't had a chance to do that, you need to do that. All right. So the moths are out. Now, once the moths are out, female moths, we'll bring her back in. She looks like she's getting antsy. Female moths do not. Yeah, she is getting antsy. Female moths do not like to fly because they're heavy. They're egg laden. And this is a female. The males are going to quickly fly. The males want to get up in the air and they want to go do their thing. All right. And what happens? Males are going to go up into the air and they're going to fly into the wind. And while they're flying into the wind, these female moths are going to be putting out a pheromone. That pheromone is like perfume. And guess what insects do with their antenna? They smell with their antenna. And check it. You know what? The male moths are flying in the dark and they're smelling with their antenna. They're picking up that pheromone and the, the stronger that smell gets, the closer they're getting to the female. And they know if they go past her, well, they, run out of they run out of smell. So they know they have to hook back around and come back into the wind. And they may do that two, three, four times until they home in on her. Once they find each other, once the male locates the female, then they're gonna hook up and they're gonna mate. And these moths will sometimes mate anywhere from three hours to three days. Longer is better in this case because the longer they mate, the more eggs are going to get fertilized. Shorter, shorter mating times results in less fertilization. So it's good that they mate for long periods like that. Um, and especially when I'm trying to breed them like this, I if I can get two moths to hook up, I'll put them in a cage and yeah, she's getting ready. I'll put them in a cage and then I will uh, put that cage like, you know, I'll hide it in, in one of our spare rooms or something. I'll put it somewhere where nobody is going to bother those two. You know, you put a little bit of mood lighting in, you put a little bit of berry white on and no, I don't do that either. But I put, I just, I just put them in the dark and I, and I camp them out in the cage in the dark for a little bit and I let them go and I'll leave them in there. As long as they're hooked up, they'll stay in that room. And I, and I'll turn lights on at nighttime as well, because I think what happens if I turn the lights off at night, I think the male starts getting antsy and thinking he needs to be out flying around again. I don't like to do that. So I keep lights turned on, keep them under light as much as I can. And that's how I lengthen out. That's how I get more of that time frame in there and get more fertilized eggs. Big difference. Just some tips I'm throwing at you. Whether you want to take the advice or not, that's up to you. It works for me. Okay. So they're out there. They're going to mate. Now, when they, when they get done mating, the male, two weeks. Male giant silk moths can live about two weeks. He's going to clock out for the day. He's going to take off. He's going to live two weeks, and he can take on several females during that two-week period of time. He'll eventually burn himself out. He'll die. He becomes bird food or ant food or whatever. Either way, he does his job. He's, he's keeping the food chain fat and happy at both ends of that scale. Now, the female moth, these big female moths, just like this one, the big female moths, their average lifespan, once they're out of the cocoon, is about four days. Four days is it. That's all they that's all they really get because their job is to lay the eggs, feed the food chain, and die. That's what they do. So they come out of the cocoon, they attract the mate, they mate, they lay eggs, and they die. That's simple. There's not a lot of light, not a lot more to it. Now, these giant silk moths do not have mouths. Do not try and feed them. Uh, I get I get people that will send me messages and say, hey, we just found this, this really cool moth and, and we put some sugar water in there, but it doesn't look like it's eating. And you know what? They don't have a mouth. They, they survive on what they ate as a caterpillar. The reason they don't have a mouth is because their only purpose is to fly around, mate, lay eggs, keep the food chain fat and happy. Okay? Four to 600 eggs and almost every one of those caterpillars is going to get eaten by something. That's their job. 
Okay, it's, it's, you know, that's the nice thing about breeding these things and rearing these things is I can get 350 or 400 caterpillars and I can get 250 to 300 cocoons at the end of that trip. It's a good deal, you know, to be able to have that kind of control over things and be able to contain and keep predators away and, and give these moths that big of an opportunity to survive. But in the wild, hardly any of those eggs, hardly any of those caterpillars are going to live. So they don't have a mouth. Don't try to feed them. If you find one, it's either going to be a male or a female. If it's a female and you and you catch it in the wild, you find it at your lights or whatever the case is, it's probably already mated, which means it's gravid, and you can probably put that female into a you know brown paper grocery bag or into a cage with some food plant or whatever you prefer to do and leave her in there. Close that up and just leave her in there and she will eventually lay a bunch of eggs in there. And when she does, those eggs are probably going to hatch. If you're not sure if she's, you know, if it's a cocoon and it hatches out of a cocoon and you know she hasn't been bred yet, well, that's good. And that's no big deal. Put her in the same cage, you know, set her outside and male moths will come in because she's going to put that pheromone out. Male moths will come in. They'll mate right between the bars of the cage. They will find a way. And in doing so, you will end up with a bunch of eggs that way as well. It's not real hard, a little bit of time consuming, a little bit of responsibility, but nature does all the rest. As long as you can get the eggs and you can get the caterpillars, find the food, feed them, make them fat and happy, and you'll have a really cool experience. Get those cocoons. Awesome thing. Try that. Okay? So, two weeks out for one, four days out for the other, the deal's done. That's it, man. That that is the that is the that is the deal about Cecropia moths. That is what it is. I, I can't offer you too much more advice than what I've already told you. You know there's a lot of moths out there. These are the largest moths in North America. They are the Cecropia moths. I, on the other hand, gotta get going. Guys, hit up my YouTube page, man. Hit that up. Lots of cool content over there. You know what? Like and subscribe because it doesn't cost any money, which is kind of cool. And that way I know that you like what you see over there. All right. Slowly but slowly, man, everything's going to YouTube. So that's where you're going to have to come find me eventually. But right now, I'm still right here with you guys, hanging with you guys every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. Guys, look, man, still angry. It's getting a little less angry out there, but still angry, man. I need you guys to be well. I need you to be safe, and man, let's all be kind to each other, please. Let's all be kind, all right? Guys, I want to tell you, have a great day, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for hanging with me. I love you guys. Take care.